Hello again, I'm Clinton and this is Media Ecology for the Online Community as Classroom. Today we're going to take a deep dive into two monumental books by Swiss architectural historian Siegfried Gideon, because in this series we're opting to take the long way home to our title subject, situating computers in cyberspace as one more development of the ever-evolving ground upon which and increasingly within which human communities gather. The common ground of the pre-electric world comprised parlors, salons, town squares, churches, so Gideon's work is invaluable in bridging deep perception of those physical environments with our world, when community is vitiated by so many interceding technologies of illusion. As we ramp up to an excavation of embodied humanity from video textual computer interface, we have to understand our condition as contextualized within a long history of humanity's relation to the rolling changes of literate, artisanal, industrial, and electronic forms. Canadian, Marshall McLuhan embodies the quest to unearth that common ground in a world rocked by television, and so to trace his life and inspirations is to inhere oneself within a penetrating sense of the technological world we have inherited. Let's first summarize the last video and then continue our biography of McLuhan. As we saw, young McLuhan diligently recognized the recent history of poetry as a technology, gradually progressing from the use of words to render in the mind romantic sentiments about natural landscapes towards becoming a manipulator of the mind's inner world directly. His toolkit for elaborating the progression of this technique included his intensive study of the trivium, comprising the classical grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic, which for McLuhan was the reconstitution of the genetic or logos in a form congruent to the scribal medieval world of letters. Abstract modern poetry was, in turn, an attempt to reconstitute language, the word, as fundament for the modern industrial networked scientific 20th century. By the end of the 30s, McLuhan had converted to Catholicism, largely inspired by the paradoxical writings of G.K. Chesterton. He courted and married a southern belle from Texas named Corinne Lewis, and had become a university English professor, moving all about before finally ending up teaching at St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto in 1946. While teaching, he had been having difficulties relating his old poetry to his students. By comparison, he found great success in teaching them literary criticism by applying it to pop culture and advertisements, with which the students were obviously very familiar. He was helping them analyze the media, which actually directly made up their world. Material for analysis was abundant, and McLuhan filled boxes and boxes in his office with advertisements, snipped out of magazines and newspapers for classroom purposes. These became the raw material for his first book, 1951's Mechanical Bride, the Folklore of Industrial Man. Actually, I got it right here. I see it. Just, it's all advertisements. All of it. Anyway. McLuhan read widely. And I actually cover the dedication of his vast personal library to uh, UNESCO's History of the World. Uh, memory of the World, I think. Uh, there was, I cover that in episode 5 of my Life in the Foam podcast. He basically used his students as personal research assistants to run down his avenues of interest and read for him by proxy. Uh, he'd entreat every specialist he met to recommend to him the two best, most important books written about their field of expertise. He was an incessant conversationalist and avid debater, known for inviting students or new acquaintances home for lunch or dinner, and then talking with them well into the night, often oblivious to Corinne's chagrin to how prepared the house or pantry may have been for hosting guests on that particular day. In 1943, McLuhan met Siegfried Gideon and immediately devoured his first book. In a 1967 interview with Gerd Stern, McLuhan recalled, Space, time, and architecture was one of the great events of my lifetime. The approach taken in that book, and in Gideon's second great work, Mechanization Takes Command, became foundational in McLuhan's approach to media studies. The Swiss historian of architecture Siegfried Gideon was born in 1888. He had degrees in mechanical engineering and art history. And the strange confluence of those two disciplines led to his two epic books surveying the development of the technology and art 
from the Renaissance precursors through to the Industrial Age straight up to modern times, and then projecting forward to the post-war future. The art of uh, Western civilization. Uh, as McLuhan told Stern, quote, Gideon gave us a language for tackling the structural world of architecture and artifacts of many kind in the ordinary environment. He learned this language from his preceptor, Wolflin, Wolflin, I suppose, whose principles of art history revolutionized the entire language of art criticism. Gideon began to study the environment as structural artistic works. He saw language in streets, buildings, the very texture of forms, end quote. As an English professor, McLuhan's direct study of classical manuscripts, manuscripts and literature led to his distillation of a cycle of breakdown and reconstitution of logos, or meaning constitutive language usage, evident in a millennia-long ancient quarrel in the West. A quarrel of dialectic, or logic, versus the sensory input and output of both grammar and rhetoric. Architectural art historian Gideon had quite independently elucidated that very same split in his study of human handiworks and objects of manufacture. What McLuhan had detected in the written and spoken word, Gideon diagnosed with his language of streets, buildings, and the very texture of forms. In both cases was evident a rending of the mind from the heart, of thinking from feeling, of logic from emotions, of science from art, of PC from Mac. Or maybe Unix philosophy from Mac, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, in order to illustrate this split, Gideon pioneers a new scholarly approach he calls anonymous history. His sprawling 800-page books cut through dozens and dozens of topics drawing from his decades of research into the histories of many commonplace objects and forms which are taken totally for granted they have histories and elements which remain totally unarticulated and invisible to non-specialists. Like, everything that's taken for granted that you own, basically. Just to give you a taste, he encyclopedically expounds the origins and evolution of the tumbler lock, tumbler lock, the growth of the iron and steel industries, the many permutations of the writing desk, the progressive improvements in humane technology and practices of animal handling and abattoirs, the development of factory work and assembly lines, the haphazard trial and error realization of the rules of urban planning, the mechanization of the kneading of dough, the creation of scientific management in corporations and its dehumanizing effects, the forging of new architectural styles in the wild western American front, the intricacies of the modern loom, the amalgamation of today's comprehensive home kitchen, the history of the bathing and abolition in this many cultures over the centuries. And that's just like some of it. And it's all framed within a comprehensive, progressively unfolding art history lesson. Yeah, his books are amazing. Um, his research was challenged by the ubiquity of his subjects of inquiry, though. Many times old product catalogs, schematics, and photographs of the mundane places and things he was interested in had only just been recently disposed of as like useless and taking up space right before he had arrived to study them. No one keeps the old product catalog of the nuts and bolts they sold 50 years ago for farm tractors in, you know, rural Ohio, right? And that's exactly what he was interested in. His laments over the holes in his narrative in light of the richness and fullness of his work evince the ambition of his exhaustive reach. Gideon writes... Quoting uh, Picasso, Picasso once wrote, quote, The artist is a receptacle for emotions, regardless of whether they spring from heaven, from earth, from a scrap of paper, from a passing face, or from a spider's web. That is why he must not distinguish between things. Cartier de noblesse, which is like an aristocratic method of calculation to precisely quantify the nobility of one's lineage, Cartier de noblesse does not exist among objects. And Picasso quote. Gideon continues, The historian has to take the same attitude toward his material. He wants to know the truth about life, and he must take it where he finds it. It will not do for him to study only the highest artistic realizations of a period, Often, the historian can learn more about the forces which shape its life and the common objects and utensils which are the undisguised properties, products of its industry. Now, remember what I said last time. 
Uh, I'm not an art history student or historian, so like, don't expect this video to be scholarly. And this is about feels meeting facts, so I'm not trying to be like super objective here. The end goal of my video series here is to arrive at an intuitive understanding of Marshall, McLuhan's me Marshall McLuhan's media ecology. So to that end, in this video, we're gonna get like downright mythopoetic, okay? All right, here we go. Let's feel the texture of a few select swaths of Gideon's rich historical tapestry, which was woven specially intended to balm and mend the fractured modern psyche to ultimately reunify the human soul. Renaissance. For most of human history, the objects of a drawing or painting were each portrayed in their own full sense arranged by relation to the other objects in flat juxtaposition in two dimensions. But in Florence, about 1400, the Renaissance began with a new private personal conception of space complementary to a new sort of person. This space conception was captured by a new graphic art style called perspective, which contorted on the canvas the shape and size of all the elements in the scene in accordance to the point of view of a single beholder who was looking into that scene. Gideon writes, quote, With the invention of perspective, the modern notion of individualism found its artistic counterpart. End quote. Big things were up close, small things were far away, Objects were skewed and stretched and angled so as to seem to exist in a specific position and depth in space relative to the viewer. For the first time, areas and lines on a flat surface became virtual, became directly analogous in the physical sense to the Euclid's conception of the geometry of physical reality. In other words, the contents of the two-dimensional canvas in perspective style is precisely very similar to three-dimensional space. This early fresco, with its three-dimensional barrel-vaulted ceiling, astounded worshippers with its illusion of creating a hole in the wall. But it also is the first presentation of a viable solution to a long-standing architectural problem with vaulting ceilings, which would only be manifested concretely decades later. In Gideon's telling, perspective art as a technical skill was taken up nearly unanimously, by the artists of the culture just as soon as it was invented. This signifies a near complete unity of thinking and feeling at the flashpoint of the Renaissance. The artist and the scientist were the one in the same person. The architecture of this era was monumental with a capital M, made of simple, elegant shapes, grand and majestic, using all the innovations which the new scientific conceptions of space inspired. Urban planning began ideating cities as emanating from a central focal point outward, geometrically structured and star-shaped toward outer defensive walls. Throughout the Renaissance, all levels of design from a single room interior to like buildings to the whole city layout were coordinatable through the rule of, you know, centralized planners. There wasn't a lot of like freedom as we think of it today. Gideon places polymaths like Michelangelo and da Vinci within this understanding of the age. From there, space, time, and architecture goes on to the story of the emergence of the Baroque style. Baroque emerges from the more massive, disorganized development of Rome in the late 16th century, initiated under Pope Sixtus V, the first modern town planner. Here, the development of uh, cities at this scale by, was by many different competing developers and financers, and it may have been indirectly guided through regulation and road planning and zoning, but was otherwise beyond centralized vision and control. For instance, Sixtus V restored the ancient aqueducts, culminating in this audaciously monumental water fountain, which was ample enough for its many intended purposes, but aesthetically completely out of place. Rapid city growth had broke the human urban scale of the Renaissance, and from its elemental forms were spun a sometimes symphonious, often cacophonous explosion of divergent elaborations and disproportionate, jarring juxtapositions. This was Baroque. Freed from restraints imposed by a ruling class of prudent planners, Baroque architectural designs developed spontaneously, becoming more and more experimental and creative. Curvaceous, undulating walls whose waves supplanted the straight lines of the Renaissance were particularly contentious and often seen as decadent and gaudy. And Baroque 
architecture portended patterns for many other areas of humans' invention and creativity. Gideon's second book, Mechanization Takes Command, goes beyond architecture. It showcases the many handicrafts of other various skilled artisans during and after this time, which are exemplary of unified form and style. In the domain of seats, the science of engineering was finessing the hand fashioning of ever finer wooden frames capable of bearing the weight of the human body, while still imbued with aesthetically pleasing organic forms. By even the mid-18th century, Gideon finds this unity invinced in many handicrafts. Of all the many facets of human life surveyed in Mechanization Takes Command, Gideon's treatment of chairs must suffice here to illustrate the cultural schism he tracks throughout the massive disruption which was about to come. We're sticking with chairs. There's much more in the books. Read the books, but you gotta stick with chairs. What was that disruption? As the unified artist engineers of the Renaissance were being led off the leash in the Baroque period, something was afoot in the British Isles. Fast-growing cities like Manchester and Birmingham epitomized a new form of totally unplanned city. The factory city. This was driven by systematic refinement and upscaling of production techniques for two fundamental materials, cotton and iron. As the formalism behind perspective art had led to the precision of engineering, it became ever easier for anyone to simply draft a design on paper and pay to have it fashioned and delivered. With developments of iron casting, the structures which made up a city came to be created piecewise in factories and assembled on site, beginning with all the buildings in the factory towns themselves. This was construction. And these buildings didn't need to be pretty, they just had to be functional. Across developing America, ironworks was essential for erecting much-needed infrastructure. Writes Gideon, quote, The Industrial Revolution, the abrupt increase in production brought about during the 18th century by the introduction of the factory system and the machine, changed the whole appearance of the world far more so than the social revolution in France. Political revolutions subside, after a certain time, into a new social equilibrium. But the equilibrium that went out of human life with the Industrial Revolution has not been restored to this day. The destruction of man's inner quiet and security has remained its most conspicuous effect. The individual goes under before the march of production. He is devoured by it. The takeoff of plans made on paper, easily manifested by manufacturing processes at massive scale, was called industrialism. It tore an abrupt, radical split in the methods of human artifice. Buildings ceased to be the exclusive domain of architects. And architects, the artists of buildings, were slow to take on the ugly new forms and materials, understandably favoring traditional hand-fashioned quarry stone and wooden frames. They clung to the human scale in the face of rampant, ugly construction. High art, objects to be appreciated aesthetically, were going to start drifting away from objects of pure use. Despite protests against ugly utilitarian iron and cheap manufactured wares, the human imagination, inspired by the unlocked potentials in the new sciences and techniques, had been aching to express itself in these new forms. Often suppressed by conservative social forces, the urge to invent was never stopped but only diverted into strange outlets. Inventive visionaries inevitably drew out from the fecund potential of industrial production an unstoppable wave of material forms both handcrafted and manufactured, from creepy lifelike mechanical dolls fashioned with watchmaker precision, to entire dystopic hellscapes of endless factory cities pumping out billows of smoke and bolts of cloth manufactured on many spinning jennies and automated looms. The human imagination was let loose onto the material world, at every level. Of the 18th century, Gideon writes, quote, Everyone was inventing. Many of these inventors did not even take the trouble to protect their discoveries by taking out patents on them. Many, far from drawing profits from their inventions, were even persecuted because of them. Profit-making and unfair exploitation belong to a later period. End quote. Now, the continuous development of technique and engineering led to ever more intricate and efficient planning and precision in manufacture. By the end of the 19th century, the framework of massive structures could be designed and ordered for perfect on-site assembly out of delivered parts with error tolerances of one-tenth of one millimeter. 
carefully drafted hand-drawn paper plans contained within them realizable physical forms of near unbounded scale from pocket watches to superstructures of iron and glass. And all this carried on in a world divorced from that of human feeling, taste, comfort, and culture. As the practical science-minded thinkers had been going their own way in industry and manufacturing, the arts were being led into derivative revivals of classical styles. In 1804, Napoleon became the Emperor of France, and his aesthetic taste came to establish the Empire style, which spread across the whole world in a more democratized form long after his death. Napoleon was a self-made man in a new century, but he sought to imitate the ruling dynasties of old Europe, explains Gideon. To become their equal, he adopted their titles, their ceremonies, their forms of government. To become one with them, he mingled his blood with theirs in marriage, miscalculating so far as to believe that a new dynasty might be founded in the 19th century. Beside him, the monarchs of his time are without stature. Yet, as soon as he seeks to be their equal, they tower over him. In other words, it's as if a modern painter were craving admission to the French Academy. Napoleon's dimensions never allowed him to deal in half measures. He willed a style worthy of the Caesars and of himself, and did not hesitate to make the setting his own. It bears his imprint through and through. End quote. Napoleon's empire style grew mostly from two artists he patroned, Charles Percier and Pierre-François Louis Fontaine. The primary elements of expression was ornament and flourish. Technical innovation, functionality, or balanced proportionate floor plans played no role in their interior decorating or architecture. Everything was aesthetic, and the more, the better. Richness in superficiality reigned, and subtlety and reserve were banished. In Empire style, utility comes a, dis a distant second. All possessions become, first and foremost, display pieces. Why have one sphinx when you can have four, topless, balancing flower pots on their heads, right? What takes place in the Empire style, says Gideon, is nothing other than a devaluation of symbols. As Napoleon devaluated nobility, so he devaluated ornament, end quote. Gideon continues. This devaluation of symbols is seen time after time in the Empire style. The laurel wreath, which the Romans used sparingly because of its significance, forms almost a trademark of the Empire style. It spreads like ivy over entire pilasters, or is stamped on the walls of the Tuileries throne room which Percier and Fontaine decorated for Napoleon. And is it not telling that one felt no incongruity in using the frieze of crowning victory with palms even on teapots? Or that the thirsty staff, carried in antiquity by the worshippers of Dionysius only at the most solemn of festivals, now serves as a curtain rod? End quote. The substance of these and subsequent empire style designers was surface aesthetics. Their drawings and plans, unlike the engineer, were of superficial, final appearances, space itself becoming a canvas of juxtaposed symbols without consideration of the form of the whole, either materially or spatially or even practically. Writes Gideon, The decisive step toward the 19th century in empire style was the beginning of spatial disintegration. Pieces are often conceived as isolated entities, and furniture loses its relatedness to the surrounding space. Here, the upholsterer, the decorator, announces his claim to leadership. Fabric soon wrapped space in its garments, muffling all boundaries. The florid drapery was of calculated carelessness. Skilled workers knew how to cut and sew these difficult pieces and cast them with casual effect over their curtain rods. Fringes, double or threefold, give additional weight. The calico curtains, asymmetrically crossing, are gathered in generous folds. Windows, doors, and alcoves are abandoned to the upholsterer's fancy. End quote. Now, mechanization played a key role in this movement from the measured, proportioned spatial conceptions of the Renaissance architect to the space-obliterating maelstrom of transient superficial redressings of surface by the interior decorator. 
or upholsterer who blankets and shrouds everything in cloth. The environment created by upholsterers, like those dastardly UX designers today, was an intentional misdirection thwarting any sense of the real material world. Continues Gideon. Mechanization confused the human environment, with symptoms such as the industrial reproduction of art objects, the counterfeiting and adulteration of handicraft methods, and a decaying sense of material. Lost, it would seem, was man's instinct for quiet surroundings and for the dignity of space. The same temper pervaded all classes of society, only the materials and execution varied. The statutary may be in chiseled bronze or, for the less wealthy, cast iron. Marble or plaster, china or paper mache, hand wrung silver or pressed tin. The process moves on to attack wall and floor surfaces. The carpets may be oriental or machine made. The pictures original or chromolithographs. At no other time in history did man allow the instinct for the goodly ordering of his surroundings to suffer such decay. End quote. The ubiquity of mechanized goods led to a market driven by what Gideon calls ruling taste. Ruling taste. As centralized planning decayed in the Baroque period, rulership of taste was now democrat no, rulership was now democratized by the unrefined tastes of the market. Rulership of form, I mean. Beginning with the Empire style, demand for certain aesthetics would come in waves based on the whims of the crowd. It was the beginning of fads, of the feelings of the masses subsumed by the transient mood of the moment, often dictated by nostalgia for lack of any ingenious leaps which would require creativity and daring on behalf of the masses who aren't artists and so dwell in nostalgia, demand only the same thing. Quote, Perhaps the most characteristic feature of 19th century architecture is its addiction to period pieces. All of the important buildings, all of those edifices from which the spectator imagined himself to gain serious aesthetic impression, appeared in elaborate historical dress. The theoretical issue, which received the most attention at the time, of well, the issues which achieved the most attention were those raised by the various revivals. Now classical, now gothic. Advances in building technique seem to have brought with them only the practical problems involved in using the new methods to produce old effects. Art was stuck, recircling the old ground, meeting the ruling taste of a new consumer crowd who increasingly didn't know what they wanted next, who were merely gorging on the sensory stimulation of ever more extravagant embellishments and reminiscences evoked by endless remixes of the old and the familiar. The desacralizing and autocannibalism of symbolism, ornamentation, and all material artifacts led to increasing ennui and panic by artists and aesthetes, who were helpless to respond except to continue covering it all up with more and more layers of fabric, more fabric. They stood opposed to mechanization, to the heartless, unfeeling forces of industry which produced an ever more fake world, even while it facilitated the upscaling of their work for sale in the mass market. As they tried to run from the inescapable technology, their feelings came out in their work, turning the spaces of human activity into false, illusory dream worlds of escape where superficial appearances could only obscure the world's actual material and formal constitution. In seeding, our case study in this video, the manufactured nature of factory-made, affordable couches was upholstered over until swallowed whole by cushioning. Right, Skidian. The furniture of the ruling taste assumes to liberate a wealth of feeling and fantasy, but its pieces were not created in the most direct way. They were reflectively created. T.S. Eliot calls the poets of Victorian taste reflective. He writes, quote, they think, but they do not feel their thoughts as immediately as the odor of a rose. That's how Eliot puts it. Gideon continues, No less than the poetry of the ruling taste, intimate surroundings were created reflectively, lacking the leap into the unknown, the inventive. 
a powerful side of the 19th century is here revealed. The mask-like. Its view of real life is as deceptive as that of the wax museum. End quote. And yet, in a domain far away from aesthetics and the ruling tastes of Europe, a way out of the cul-de-sac of being smothered by machine-woven pillows was being innovated. Continues Gideon, Over and against this reflectiveness stands patent furniture. Here there is no room for reflection. All derivative feeling has fallen away as the skin from a skeleton. Sometimes patent furniture strikes the grotesque. Often it is congenial and startlingly direct. In this furniture, whose sole aim is to serve needs previously without claim or without solution, and whose construction rules out everything but the bare formulation and inventive fantasy, the creative urge succeeds in piercing through. The U.S. patent system was formed in 1790. As Wikipedia puts it, a patent is a right granted to the inventor of a process, machine, article of manufacture, or composition of matter that is new, useful, and non-obvious. For the purposes of, of this series, we will think of the patent as hardware source code. A patent document spells out in meticulous detail the form and functionality of the creation being protected for exclusive manufacture and sale by the owner, and for whomever they license permission. In researching mechanization takes command, Gideon poured over dozens and dozens of patents, meticulously tracing the development of technology throughout the Industrial Revolution. After a section on old-fashioned handmade rocking chairs, the book moves to the first American patent for a new, mechanized rocking chair, which pivots tightly just below the seat, instead of rolling across the floor in broad sweeps. This movement is buffered by springs to prevent the sitter from violently flopping forward or backward. This new rocking chair also compounds the motion with the ability to rotate or swivel. Oh yeah. Gideon writes, quote, The chair of 1853 was meant for relaxation. Its inventor, Peter Tanike, a name as unknown as those in the telephone book, had nothing in mind beyond an improved rocking chair, or as he calls it, a sitting chair. No one thought of its one-sided use in the office. The 50s used chairs of this type in the home. Americans, developing their own styles far from the influences of European aesthetics, embraced the new industrial forms nakedly and without shame. Here, we see a design for a better mechanical chair, now specified as an office chair, with improved rocking mechanism and the added ability to be raised and lowered as you swivel. Ah, uh, again, an unknown, uncelebrated name. Robert Fitz Jr. of Fitchburg, Massachusetts, claims this achievement in innovation in the anonymous history of our modern world. Of America at this time, Gideon says, quote, In the four decades from 1850 to 1890, no activity of everyday life was taken for granted. An unbridled inventive urge shaped everything anew. Furniture, like other things, underwent transformation. This called for an independence of feeling and a courage to see with new and untrained eyes. These very qualities made the nation's vigor at this stage. No conventions cramp the combinatory faculties, whether the anonymous inventors develop types for new purposes, or whether they endow existing types with an undreamed-of convertibility and mobility. Under the patent system, says Gideon, quote, Furniture was dissected into separate elements, into separate planes. These movable elements, which a governing mechanism linked and regulated, enabled the furniture to change in adaptation to the body and various postures. The furniture was thus endowed with a flexibility unknown before and ceased to be a rigid, static implement. Patent furniture could perform alternate functions. What interests us more, it could take on any desired position of the human body, change from this position, and return to the normal. Comfort actively rested by adaptation to the body as against comfort passively derived from sinking back into cushions. Here is the whole difference between the constituent furniture and the transitory furniture of the last century. End quote. 
while the thralls to European ruling taste were rearranging the ornamentation and fringe of overcrowded salons, exhausted for new ideas, Americans were embracing the core of cultural growth, building from the fundamentals of technique, motion, and form with practicality and simplicity. However, quote, in the 90s, an influx of European ruling taste flooded America. Well known as the turning point is the Chicago's World Fair of 1893. The attitude that it enthroned. A surrender to the copied classical architecture in direct supply from the French Academy rejected the flat machine-made surfaces of American equipment as too meager and the patent furniture as ridiculously out of place. Mechanized furniture disappeared from living quarters. People began to be ashamed of it. From then on, the whole movement gathered around furniture for special, technical purposes. Patent furniture was banished from the house, and countless attempts to create a truly 19th century comfort went to waste. End quote. And thereafter, adjustable chairs, like this one, would be relegated to hospitals and doctor's offices, and not the private residences of normal, well-adjusted people. In the history that might have been, Aaron P. Gould of Canton, Ohio, would be revered and forever remembered by more than just surgeons and dentists for his contribution to the essential science of dynamic seating. But it was not to be. Thanks to the 1893 Chicago World Fair, yeah, and the one with the Ferris wheel. Now, instead of consciously merging with machines like anime pilots climbing into robotic exoskeletons, Americans sink somnambulistically each evening into the dark, Lovecraftian, unfathomable mechanical mysteries of that squishy black box, 1928's Lazy Boy Recliner. Gideon continues, This happened at a time when Europe was beginning to realize into what plight it had been drawn by the ruling taste. But a radical new development was rising on the continental artistic horizon, sparked by this new awareness, threatening the now more abundant neoclassical hegemon of empire style. In Space, Time, and Architecture, Gideon writes, quote, for a hundred years, architecture lay smothered in a dead, eclectic atmosphere in spite of its continual attempts at escape. All that while, construction played the part of architecture's subconsciousness. Construction contained things which architecture prophesied and half-revealed long before they could become realities. The constituent facts in the 19th century can often be found in construction when the ruling architecture gives no clue to them. It is construction and not architecture which offers the best guideposts through the century. In Mechanization Takes Command, he writes, Sheltered in the shadow of industry and protected by the authority of science, engineers were not hampered in their development, for they did not have to play up to the ruling taste. And although their names were unknown in their day, they are noted in history and will not be forgotten. Could an engineer... Any engineer stand a chance of having their name publicly remembered in the same vein as the great Renaissance and Baroque artists? Could the lifeless, historically ruminating, ruling taste in architecture be forced awake and dragged into modernity? The answer came when the proposal by a French construction firm was selected by the organizers of the 1889 Paris Exhibition to provide their monumental centerpiece exhibit. The firm had, until then, only been known for constructing railway bridges in the middle of nowhere. And, like, you can't even see a bridge when you're on it. Their these were not display pieces. They were a construction firm. Their last project had been this massive half-kilometer-long Garabit viaduct, designed by the company founder and lead engineer Gustav Eiffel. After the initial proposal for the Paris exhibit was accepted, it took two years for the calculations and plans of its 18,038 parts to be calculated and drawn up before another two years of manufacture and assembly on site. 
the Eiffel Tower, tallest in the world, tore through not just the Parisian skyline, the raw engineering, which like a dirty secret had undergirded the civilized world so discreetly, which so suddenly and immodestly dominated the French capital had, for its sensitive, aesthetically cultivated victims, torn a hole in the fabric of reality itself. The artistic psyche of Europe was devastated. There were protests and petitions against its erection. It was monstrous, a menace, a disgrace. According to Gideon, it took 20 years for the tower to become feasibly integratable into artistic sensibilities, and that was at the price of the total explosion and obsolescence of the Renaissance Euclidean spatial conception by Minkowski's formulation of the space-time continuum and Einstein's theory of relativity. Gideon quotes poet Blaise André. At that time, there was no artistic formula that could claim to express the plasticity of the Eiffel Tower. Under the laws of realism, it crumbled, and the laws of Italian perspective could not catch it. But Delaunay wanted to find a plastic interpretation. He dismembered the tower so that he might enter within its frame. He truncated it and inclined it to make it express the vertigo of its full 300 meters. He took 10 standpoints, 15 outlooks. He looked at this part from below, that part from above, the surrounding houses from the right, from the left, from the wings of the bird, and from the bed of the earth. End quote. And so, as the century turned, likewise would the entire art world be turned upside down, disoriented, and shook of all of its sureties out through the opening first pricked by Eiffel's indecent exposure. The terrain of modernity had sliced irreparably through the canvas of tradition's map, leaving perhaps the clearest path, one toward perdition's flames. Fortunately, new ways forward had been simmering for decades. In architecture, various subtler integrations of form with aesthetic had been incubating in seclusion for years before the impetus for new burst into the fore with overriding urgency at the 19th century's close. William Morris was among the first artists who, out of desperation, was driven to take up architecture so as to have an honest house in which to start and raise his family. Detesting the ubiquitous, highly ornamental styles of his day, his red house was made shockingly plain and based on medieval and gothic forms, not as superficial imitation, but as practical means of construction. Brick was exposed, wasn't covered over to make like, to look like, you know, stone masonry. A few decades later, an entire scene of like-minded revolutionaries had grown up in protest of neoclassical revivalism, and all returned to basics using materials of modern construction as elements in the aesthetic features of their, of their architecture and interior design. In his 1894 textbook, Modern Architecture, Professor Otto Wagner of the Academy of Vienna despaired the layman's judgment, which, quote, always has been and is disastrous in its influence, end quote. Wagner, a seasoned architect pushing back against the moribund ruling taste, held with Goethe's dictum, the artist must create what the public ought to like, not what it does like. The works of this new movement was shared worldwide in a periodical called L'Art Modern, uh, Modern Art, which remained in print over 30 turbulent transformative years. In its first issue, the mandate of L'Art Modern is spelled out. Quote, Art is for us the contrary of every recipe and formula. Art is the eternally spontaneous and free action of man on his environment for the purpose of transforming it and making it conform to a new idea. One of its first sallies to tradition was Victor Horta's total gutting and reconstruction of the interior of residential address 12 Rue de Terrain in Brussels. It was, like an American house, designed first to be functional for its residents. Whoa, crazy idea, right? Its floors were broken up into various levels throughout and the main staircase featured exposed, elegantly fashioned bare iron railings and columns as part of its finished design. This was a totally new and daring aesthetic innovation. Iron became part of architectural expression. Developments in science and engineering were 
however subliminally, now being expressed through the production of artists and designers. This, for Gideon, is the mark of a transcendent spirit which resonates in any age across its various fields through the sensibilities of its receptive and productive creators, the ideas of science influencing art. The painful, belated capitulation of artistic sensibility to scientific insight, the belatedness had resulted in traumatic works like those of Picasso expressing a world beheld anew where once solid objects, frozen in time, were now seen twisted about with all facets present. The single perspective of the Renaissance was shattered, strewn across time in constant motion, transparent for being exposed from all directions simultaneously in the imagination. Modern art is thus the result of the hurried attempt at realigning aesthetic feeling with the functional realities and brisk pace of the long industrialized, long me mechanized landscape which romanticism and nostalgia for too long had tried to obscure with its desperate facades. As containment failed, the sensory onslaught upon the heart by the new forms torn away from comfortable nostalgia and tradition impelled artists to resort and reinterpret their inventions of reality from the ground up according to the new maths and sciences which were shaping that reality. Even in spite of the mathematicians and scientists who did not reciprocate with the recognition of their own formulas when expressed in paint and sculpture and architecture. In the new building designs, transparency and perception of fullness of form from any given angle was given priority. Among the most prominent of architects experimenting with these new 20th century spatial conceptions was Le Corbusier. Of this particular design of his, Gideon writes, quote, It is impossible to comprehend the Savoy House from a view from any single point. Quite literally, it is a construction in space-time. The body of the house has been hollowed out in every direction, from above and below, within and without. A cross-section at any point shows inner and outer space penetrating each other inextricably. End quote. Fundamental to Le Corbusier's work was a new basic construction material only just coming into maturity. It was a wet compound of quicklime, clay, sand, and crushed iron slag, which could harden to stone in a matter of days. Concrete was quickly taken up as a medium for architectonic expression in the modern art revolution, and its various molded forms became emblematic of a century breaking free of its past into a daring, plastic new future. Gideon's endless excavation of the past in these books is a way to orient the present here in situ and restore an integral sense of place and meaning for moving forward. So while most of space-time and architecture and mechanization takes command are retrospective, this is precisely so as to contextualize the mid-20th century West as continuing on a long, unbroken, implicit trajectory from out of the past. His criticisms and insight on interior and contemporary forms gracefully drop the reader into a newly enriched perception of the present moment, in which they themselves play an essential constitutive role, freed from both the transience of ruling taste and the mood swings of its passing fads, and the inhuman utility of abstract engineering cold to human feeling and aesthetic. Mechanization Takes Command closes with a section which covers the ancient origins of public bathing and religious cleansing rituals, moving through several abortive attempts to import saunas and Turkish bathhouses into Western society, culminating in the emergence of sunbathing as a leisure activity and the precise means of manufacturing bathtubs affordable and durable enough to facilitate our present enjoyment of private residences which each feature their own indoor bathroom. Want to know how you got a bathroom? Want to read like 50 pages on how you got a bathroom? Mechanization takes command is amazing. Uh, projecting into the future, Gideon examines some patents by Buckminster Fuller for his vision of the fully automated home for like the entire planet. Fuller's factory-built houses are designed around a pump, water heater, furnace, fuse panel, all the other complex mechanical infrastructure of the modern household comprising a mechanical core. 
Gideon, after examining uh, Fuller's uh, patents, uh, complains that Bucky is all head and no heart for aesthetics, and risks undoing decades of humanization with his rush to churn out mass-produced, machine-centric, fully industrialized housing units for all of humanity. Of Bucky's assembly line dwelling unit, Gideon writes, quote, Freedom to alter the ground plan or add to it is abolished, the dweller being imprisoned within the rigid uniform shell. Why? Because in the center, with its mast, sits a robot, the mechanical core, tyrannizing the whole structure. A house is neither an automobile nor a trailer. Houses do not move. Houses stand on a specific site and must adapt themselves to this environment. Houses rolling ready-made off an assembly line will but rarely satisfy on this score. Hence, the solution of the mechanical core, like that of the prefabricated house, depends on one condition. Freedom, allied with coordination. For neither he who dwells in the house, nor he who designs it, should suffer himself to be tied. That is, the task of mechanization is not to deliver ready-made, stamped-out houses or mechanical cores, but flexible, standardized elements admitting of various constellations so as to create better and more comfortable dwellings." End quote. Moving in one direction, Gideon applied the techniques of art criticism to the engineering evinced in patents and product catalogs, xylographs and photographs of factories and mechanisms. Simultaneously, moving in the other direction, Gideon revealed the engineering and mechanisms beneath the forms, styles, symbols, and ornaments of art and design, which express the aesthetics and emotions of various ages. By walking this line of force, bearing the tension of these opposing motions, Gideon blazed his own trail through the reunification of heart and mind, of thinking and feeling. This balance of opposing sensibilities was his formulation of a notion expounded by German poet Friedrich Schiller, that of equipoise. The term is rich in suggestion. Think of a parkour artist, or a tightrope walker, an athlete, a gymnast, a dancer, anyone with poise. To think of someone whose body is trained into perfect harmony with its environment. Trained, embodiment, and trained in perfect harmony with its environment. Their grace comes from their relationship with, their grounding within, and mastery over the material arena with which it interplays. Anyone skilled with a tool who trains to wield it as a natural extension of their body appreciates intrinsically the functionality of that tool's form. It integrates it into their whole being. So likewise, anyone who fancies themselves a critic or an engineer who unpacks what they sense into the dynamic of its constitutive parts, must train to achieve a similar balance of cohering thinking and feeling in their perception to recognize the meaning inherent in the world. Perhaps, in the 20th century, as aesthetic expression and artistic sensibility on one hand, and scientific discovery and engineering practice on the other, converged in all levels of material production, so too could the inner psychic lives of humanity be gently guided into a reunification of feeling and thinking. This was the hope of a Siegfried Gideon in wartime, desperately collecting and studying research materials for these two great volumes, striving to rediscover and recreate the living human soul of the West as we have inherited it. As we get into McLuhan, you should now recognize the sensibility of a soul in equipoise, embodied and in action, as television dawns on the post-war scene. Now, in compressing these very dense, very long books covering centuries of transatlantic history, I've had to indulge in some creative uh, license in artistic liberties, dramatics, uh, flair, whatnot in my narrative. Like, check out the books. When you read the books, you'll find that I've left out, like, 
nearly all the most interesting stuff. Like, this was nothing, right? But I hope that I have concentrated an ideal distillation of the approach Gideon takes to humanity's relation to our constructed environments. It's the same approach which McLuhan definitely adopts and adapts for his and our purposes in this series. The point is, space is not dead or inert. Our shared real world is alive, the culmination of all of the minds whose dreams and visions comprise its very substance. It lacks life in our sense of it, owing only our ignorance of its anonymous architects and their mastery of the materials and forms of their day. Likewise, inventors and engineers who use technology to make things possible drift in and out of confluence with fulfilling the emotional and aesthetic needs of human comfort and well-being. With the return of salience to our world's constitution as both machine and work of art, together may also come a new common ground upon which humanity can gather in understanding. While the English student McLuhan had been a man of words, seeking unity in their perfect juxtaposition and delivery, engineer and art historian Gideon was a master of objects and their placement within, within the greater perceptual schemas shared by common culture capable of communion about them. Soon we'll see how these ideals of perceptual equipoise in a changing landscape prepared McLuhan for realizing immediately the ramification of television's arrival on the domestic scene. Um, on June 26, I'll be in Toronto for the Media Ecology Association's annual convention, where I'll, I'll cut straight to the chase regarding the computer stack and its place in our modern environment as it relates to like everything we just went over. A lot's changed since my initial submission. If you've read it, like check out my site, uh, concernednetizen.com. I've got some links below if you'd like to sponsor this series. That'd really go a long way towards helping me continue to produce content on a timely schedule. Um, otherwise, again... Thanks for joining me for another uh, little uh, lecture on media ecology for the online community as classroom. And until next time, take care of yourself out there in the media maelstrom. Bye.